Hello and welcome and thanks for having me here uh, for uh, your event. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm the Dean of Research for the SANS Technology Institute. Now, one of the things that I'm doing uh, for SANS here is uh, being responsible for the research is also run the Internet uh, Storm Center. And uh, what I want to talk here about uh, for the next you know, half hour, 45 minutes is what we learn actually from all the data that uh, we are collecting. So this is a part of the SANS Technology Institute that's uh, who I work for. Now, uh, most of the work that I'm doing is actually related to the master's degree that we are offering. Uh, we are offering that now for oh, quite a few years. I think it's almost 10 years now uh, that we have uh, this master's degree as part of our science technology offering. Now, if you are not interested in a full master's degree, we also have graduate certificate uh, programs. Uh, they're usually just uh, three, four classes, uh, so uh, quite a bit more approachable uh, to uh, get a taste of what we have to offer, uh, but uh, also to get, of course, uh, graduate uh, credits for that. If you don't yet have an undergraduate program, uh, we can help you with that as well. Uh, we do have an undergraduate certificate uh, program. So uh, same thing, you can uh, take a couple of classes. We have a number of uh, specializations uh, for the graduate uh, certificates. Uh, but uh, anyway, if you want to learn more, uh, just sans.edu, and we have regular uh, sessions uh, online where we sort of introduce those different uh, programs. Just sign up uh, for the next one if you would like uh, to know more. But anyway, so one of the things that uh, our graduate students are actually doing for their master's degree is to participate in research, and that's uh, you know, part of my responsibility, and that's uh, where the Internet Storm Center often also uh, figures in. We actually just had uh, earlier this year an interesting project uh, where, uh, as part of the Internet Storm Center, and I'll uh, show you some of that data later, uh, we, oper we cooperate with some ISPs, in particular in Europe, and uh, one of them actually uh, gave us access uh, to an IP address space that had recently been used uh, by uh, an online crime group called Cyberbunker. They were literally located inside a, a Cold War bunker that they purchased. And uh, this graduate student was able uh, then uh, to take all of the traffic that was directed at this IP address and analyze it. And that's uh, sort of the type of data-driven research that we are doing uh, at the Internet uh, Storm Center. So what I'm going to talk here is a little bit about Internet Storm Center, what it's all about. Uh, and then sort of what we learn from it. So how do current attacks work? Uh, how uh, can we disrupt these attacks? Uh, it's not just you know, that we observe what the attacks are. We also try to come up with ways uh, to defend against these attacks. So it all started actually a pretty early um, incident.org. Incident.org was something started by SANS for Y2K. Uh, you know, everybody was afraid that as part of Y2K, attackers would take advantage of uh, some of the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities that came up uh, during uh, the transition to year 2000. And what SANS thought, hey, you know, uh, we can probably help with that. Uh, let's set up a website where people can share some of the things that they're seeing in the network as Y2K approached. Very simple website, and you sort of see it here. You know, back in '99, uh, websites look different than they look today. Uh, but uh, with all the simplicity, it actually people loved it. Uh, shortly after uh, Y2K, Sans actually briefly shut Instance.org down and said, "Hey, uh, Y2K is over. Uh, problem solved." Uh, there were a number of people that actually then called up Sans and said, "Hey, where did the site go? It, it's really useful." Uh, so Sans brought it back. Now, around the same time. Uh, I started my own project here at the Shielded Org. Originally, my training is as a physicist. Uh, so um, I was working as a research physicist uh, back then, but uh, was also involved heavily in computers. I did a lot of x-ray work. And you know, with x-rays, you always try to stand back and uh, not to get too close. Uh, so I wrote a lot of software for remote control. And um, well, um, saw all of these attacks hitting my networks. So um, I applied some of that you know, data approach, a physics approach uh, to that and collected data. That's what the shield.org was. The shield.org was a hobby really that I set up at the time. And uh, I collected firewall logs initially from friends. Then more and more people uh, sort of sent me their logs. And we really got a pretty nice sort of insight in what the attackers were up to. 
Now, eventually, SANS became aware of this, and uh, this then became the Internet Storm Center. We essentially took the shield.org, the data we collect there. We took what was instance.org, which was like all these people sending in all of the things that they are reporting, so more manual reporting. And the fusion of this is really what Internet Storm Center is all about. Now, I call it this global network security information sharing community. We're really all about sharing information, and that's so really one of these important uh, functions that we offer. Now, in order to manage all of this, uh, we actually have a number of volunteers that help us, uh, we call them handlers, instant handlers. And um, the nice thing about them is that uh, they have real jobs. Uh, it's not, uh, they're not journalists, they're not uh, people that work for government agencies who, whose job it is uh, to turn out uh, reports and such, but they'll talk about what they see in their clients' networks, in their own networks. So uh, that's really what um, what Internet Storm Center is really about. Yeah, it's, it's about putting reality behind it and, and turning around information very quickly. And yes, uh, here's sort of a couple snapshots here of uh, our uh, Internet uh, Storm Center handlers here, just to put some uh, faces and some people uh, behind what you're seeing uh, reported here on on our uh, website. And if you go to our website regularly, you may recognize uh, some of uh, the names here. I mean, like Xavier, very active right now. Uh, Didier from Belgium, he he writes awesome Python scripts. And if you ever have a malicious Word document, he has the script to take it apart uh, for you. Uh, now, so what we really provide is we provide very quick turnaround analysis of what's going on on in the internet right now. And we have all these sensors, all these volunteers that run uh, these little honeypots for us uh, that send us their data. And now we still have the de-shield function that we connect firewall logs, but uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next couple of slides. How does all evolve? And all about this is really so that quick turnaround and getting the information out to the people who need it. That's really what it's about. Also, we have a, a daily podcast. We sort of have a quick uh, five-minute summary of what's new, what's important, uh, what you should pay attention to. I always call it it's the five minutes to make you sound smarter when you come to work, uh, because you may already have some heard of some of the things that people are discussing and trying to get sort of a handle on. Now, so initially, the DeShield system just collected firewall logs. Uh, firewall logs were very interesting and still are interesting. Maybe not to new, you. And I always say, hey, incoming firewall logs, these are attacks you shouldn't really worry about because your firewall blocked them. They're interesting to us uh, because they tell us what the attackers are looking for. So that's why we like those logs. Uh, now, over time, we added additional features uh, to uh, this log collection. We are now also collecting um, web application logs. We are collecting SSH and Telnet logs. Because what we saw is that these are sort of some systems that are, of course, heavily attacked. And we wanted a little bit more insight, a little bit more granularity as to what's actually happening uh, with, for example, web applications. So, for example, when Mirai came out uh, four years ago, uh, that big botnet, uh, we saw those telnet attacks. We saw those passwords they were looking for, and we were able to tell, hey, you know, they're going after those video recorders, those security cameras, eh? and that's what they were after based on the passwords that we saw being probed for you. Now, what we are moving towards, and that's a little bit sort of the next generation of this, is what I call the Agile system. And that's really where we are then able also to alter the configuration of some of these honeypots as attacks evolve. We see this in particular with web applications. Web applications are often direct, or web application attacks are often directed at very specific web applications where there was a new vulnerability recently. Well, uh, with this Agile system, we can basically tell our honeypots, hey, behave like this web application. Like a lot of uh, these attacks, of course, and also of these Internet of Things devices. So uh, we can tell like one half our honeypots, hey, behave like, in a, like a fridge. And if fridges are being attacked, we'll see these attacks in, uh, in these honeypots. So um, that's what this system is that we're currently developing. And so our platform uh, that we're working with here is this Raspberry Pi. Anybody here has one of them? Uh -oh. 
usually you can tell the geeks by how many they have sitting uh, at home uh, in in their network uh, just to play around with a relatively cheap uh, but very capable so a little computer uh, that um, you can install Linux on, and then you know, with our software uh, that we uh, provide, you can turn that into a real neat little honeypot. And uh, with this agile system, we, we have been playing a little bit with this. Like I mentioned at the beginning, we're working with some ISPs. One big ISP we're working with is in the Netherlands. And uh, we sort of deployed a little prototype system uh, with them. and um, so we can turn uh, these honeypots uh, into whatever system we would like uh, it to look like. And what you can see here is actually, this is an older example here with uh, screen OS. Um, notice how the Netherlands is like the most vulnerable country out there. Mm -hmm. uh, this graph is taken from Shodan. Shodan is a search engine that sort of you know, finds vulnerable systems uh, on the internet. Uh, here, same with like WebLogic. Uh, this was a vulnerability back in 2018. We told our honeypots in the Netherlands, hey, behave like WebLogic. And you see how all of a sudden, the Netherlands mm, has 10 times the WebLogic systems that China had. Uh, so we can really saturate the internet uh, with vulnerable systems. And yes, attackers, attackers can always figure out that something is a honeypot, but they can't really avoid our honeypots because they all of a sudden more honeypots than their actual vulnerable systems out there. And that, of course, gives us tremendous access uh, to, uh, to data. And I uh, really want to say thanks to everybody uh, out there uh, helping us out with this and making this, I always call this nation state level honeypotting because uh, uh, just like their nation state level attacks, we have great resource that people donate to us. And you know, thanks to all of these volunteers uh, to really provide us with this data. Now, since we have these volunteers you know, deploy these honeypots for us, send us their logs, uh, we, of course, you know, don't want to just hold on to the data. Uh, all the data we collect, uh, we turn around immediately. We use it for our own research. We share it with other researchers. But you can use it in your own network to defend your own network. So uh, that's really a good part of you know, how our data is being used. Uh, all of the data is available for download. We have a website, of course, if you're familiar with it, uh, where you can uh, examine the data. We have APIs where you can um, include that data into your own uh, scripts and such. So all of this is available for free. You, know, you, you just have to use it. You have to figure out how to use it. And you know, please also give us some data back if you, if you find our data useful. Yeah, one little word of warning here. Don't use it as block lists. Yeah? Our data comes from honeypots and such that block traffic. Uh, we have a very wide range of submitters, and that's part of the point of the project. Uh, also, not to really provide too much guidance as, to, as far as configuration goes, because uh, we kind of want a wide range of configurations. We don't want to introduce our own bias to it. Uh, but yes, our data has false positives. That's part of the point. It's research data. If you want to look into, hey, what kind of false positives are common in firewalls? We have the data you know, to look into it. We occasionally find that people use our data as block lists, and that always goes bad because that's not really what our data is for. Our data obviously provides color, provides context uh, to what, um, what you're seeing in your own logs. For example, you see an IP address attacking you. You can check on that IP address in our logs, and um, our website may, for example, tell you, hey, this is a researcher we know that's scanning the internet. It may tell you, hey, uh, this particular IP address, we don't really know what it is, but it's also scanning like 50,000 other hosts, so it's probably not targeting you. So you can really use the data to learn more about the attackers. And that's sort of you know, how you uh, provide the data. So a couple uh, bulk downloads we have uh, that make it sort of easier to, for example, incorporate the data into your own uh, log analysis system. A list of daily sources, that's all the reports essentially that we received yesterday to sort of summarize. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, created here about uh, 4 a.m. UTC, so that way we have all the logs processed uh, from the prior day, and like I said, it's updated 
once a day. Now, if you're a researcher, if uh, you want to de dive deeper into data, if you have a special research feed, we don't make that public because it takes a little bit more resources uh, to provide that. But uh, send me an email. My email address will be on the last slide, and uh, you can uh, get uh, more that way. Anyway, so like I said, paying back, we don't ask for money. I like data. Uh, there are a couple reasons why people don't send us data. So somebody say, hey, your data is not important. Uh, well, we love data actually from home networks. Like I told you, those inbound firewall logs, you may consider them you know, not really all that valuable, but they become valuable once we correlate it with all the other submitters. If your employer doesn't let you send the data, I totally understand that they don't want you to deploy um, like a little Raspberry Pi, and we also have a virtual machine in, uh, in the corporate network. If you do, great. If not, use your home network. Right? Your home network is valuable. It's difficult to submit data. That's part of fun. Yeah? Like I said, those little Raspberry Pis, everybody should have a couple. Yeah? Family pack at night. Yeah? Build a honeypot. Yeah? Uh, so um, you can have fun with kids and such to set it up and, and look at all the attacks and see what's happening out on the network. A real great sort of little educational process. But anyway, so what do we learn from all the data? Let me look at one example here. You may have heard of RDP, the Remote Desktop Protocol. It's a common way how people are remote controlling Windows systems. And of course, with the beginning of the year, with people starting to work from home, a lot more companies are relying on this protocol to manage servers and such that they still have sitting in the office. And the administrator has to occasionally check in on that server, uh, maybe patch it. So the last thing the administrator did uh, before they left the office to work from home was, hey, let's enable RDP so I can get to that server while I'm at home. I don't have to come into the office every day, which, which may be difficult in some cases. Well, the bad guys figured that out too. And this is the scanning for RDP that we saw in our sensors and how it sort of increased uh, at the beginning of the year. Now, okay, you may say, hey, I heard about this. Well, um, yes, we are now here, we are in October. You may have heard about this in July, because that's when a lot of people talked about, hey, there are people attacked by ransomware uh, that used RDP as an entry point. When you really should have worried about this was back in March, because what we saw was that around this time frame, this is the number of scans that each IP address that's submitting to us saw per day. So what this essentially means is if you see 50 here, it doesn't really matter if you see 50 or 200. One is too much. If on average, each IP address submitting to our sense, to, to our database, sees a scan a day, this means that once a day, the entire internet gets scanned for RDP. The 50 just means that there are 50 different people out there that scan the internet every single day. So you really don't have much time to get actually patched, to get set up. There was an interesting study that actually an insurance did. Now, I always like insurance. Eh? Cyber insurance is becoming sort of a big deal these days. And insurance is sort of half a history of really looking at the data. Like I said, I like data. Eh? To really look at the data to sort of figure out, hey, you know, what matters? Uh, how can we sort of adjust our uh, premiums depending on, you know, what security measures people took? This insurance company started to scan all of its clients for RDP, for exposed RDP servers, and told them, hey, you, know, you have an RDP server out there, it's probably not a good idea to have it exposed to the internet like this. After they did it for companies that they scanned, the claims for ransomware went actually down by 60 to 80%, because this is one way how a lot of this expensive ransomware that you see these days, I mean, you, just so recently, a big hospital system uh, getting taken over as such. RDP is one way how to get into these networks, these attackers. So speed matters. Yeah? You have to get it right at the beginning before it really becomes a big news item. That's sort of one thing uh, we see there. Patches matter. Yeah? 
Right? It's not just RDP. I sort of took RDP a little bit because that's uh, something that most people have in a network uh, because you have Windows servers, you need to remote manage them. And yeah, there are better ways of doing that you know, with RDP gateways and things like this. Of course, you know, setting uh, passwords and such. Now, people are sometimes afraid of Shodan. I showed some Shodan images earlier. Shodan is a public website. You can basically ask, hey, who on the internet is running RDP? And so some people just block Shodan. And again, we actually had a SANS EDU student that looked into this. And um, using our honeypots, we exposed some of them to Shodan, some not. Didn't matter whether or not your RDP server, or you didn't look for just RDP back then, but whether or not your server is listed in Shodan or not, it's going to get attacked. That's just being connected to the internet. So what other attacks do we see? These are some of the top attacks that we are seeing. And this is fairly consistent. So a lot of this is about remote access. Port 22, and then a common alternative to this port 2222, just for SSH. I mentioned Mirai, you know, the Mirai botnet. Uh, the Mirai botnet is scanning for uh, those ports, and just like port 23, and this is why these ports are at the top of the list here. Um, port 25, you know, so port 25 is all about email, SMTP. Yes, some people still run their own mail server. They haven't migrated to Outlook uh, 365 yet or such. And even if you, you know, your company migrated to a cloud-based email solution, you still often have some uh, local on-premise uh, mail servers around uh, for like some automated notifications and things like that. So that's another place. You say, now, why do people attack this? Well, brute forcing. Email passwords are extremely valuable for two reasons. Reason number one, that's sort of the more obvious reason, is uh, spam. You know? Once they get access to your mail server, they can use it to send spam. Great. You know? You're probably not that terribly worried about spam. The second part, and that's actually even more dangerous, is business email compromise. Business email compromise refers to someone injecting emails as you. I see this a lot, actually, uh, in particular with realtors. I see this a lot, uh, where uh, scammers are trying to brute force or something with phishing, get an email ad, an email username and password for a realtor, and then they just monitor the email. And they see then a client asking, hey, by the way, uh, how do I pay that down payment uh, for uh, for that house now I'm supposed to close on or something like that. You know? Then the attacker will reply. The attacker will reply with the attacker's account number. And people have lost millions of dollars. Port 8443, web applications. Yeah? Web applications are probably the largest amount sort of a custom vulnerable code that you're exposing to the world. So they have always been a, a big part sort of of the attack uh, landscape out there. And yes, they're right up there. And then, of course, port 445. Anybody knows what that is about? Windows file sharing. Another you know, one where, hey, if I can get access to some exposed uh, systems there, you know, uh, yeah, and I own that system and maybe the network. I just want to highlight one thing here. Four out of the five are about password brute forcing. So passwords are a real big deal. Attackers go after passwords. And that's just sort of another lesson I want to share you know, from our data. And you probably already know that, that passwords don't work. You think about it. What's a password supposed to be? A good password is supposed to be something long and random, right? I can't remember long and random things. Oh, I'm not supposed to write it down on a post-it. Okay. So what are you going to do? Okay, one day you have that epiphany. Hey, this is a great password. You remember it. And then you use it all over the place. 
one of those sites where you're using it gets compromised. Next thing you happens is the attacker will now use that password across all the different sites where you have accounts. And you're compromised. And very little that these sites can do about it because they don't know that you use that same password somewhere else. There is really no good way of putting it. Passwords don't work. You have to find something else. Um, of course, you know, we all now switch sort of to multi-factor authentication, passwordless authentication. It's actually another interesting approach where you say, hey, uh, you know, passwords don't work. Let's get rid of passwords and just keep a little authentication app or something like this. It's another way. FIDO2. FIDO2 uses uh, these authentication tokens, little hardware tokens. You can actually also uh, use your Windows systems, your smartphone often uh, to um, to use uh, to authenticate to a website. The nice thing about this is it's a standard, uh, so you don't really have to carry like you know a bunch of tokens around or such. One token can work uh, for a number of different websites. And yeah, the uh, the stand is actually nice enough where uh, privacy is preserved. So it's not that all of these websites know that you're the same person uh, because you're using uh, the same token. So anyway, so lesson number one was if it's exposed to the internet, it gets scanned, it gets compromised. Passwords don't work. Lesson number two, let me give you a little bit uh, light at the end of the tunnel here. Many of the attacks that you're seeing actually don't matter. Let me get back to Mirai here. So Mirai, this botnet, probably one of the largest sort of overall botnets out there right now. Um, you literally see probably like an attack a minute or so something from that botnet against your system in some cases. Okay, so why does it not matter? Mirai is looking for some very specific vulnerabilities. It's looking for exposed SSH and Telnet servers that use one of a list of specific known bad passwords. It's about 100 or so different passwords, maybe 1,000. If your password is not in that list, Mirai doesn't matter. And those passwords are usually passwords that the manufacturer set up by default. So on your Windows system, you don't have those passwords. Your Windows system is not vulnerable. What's vulnerable may be your firewall, which by default does not expose any admin interface to the internet. So it's safe. So 99% of the things that your firewall blocks is probably Mirai and doesn't matter. Now you have a web server and I told you web application attacks are a big deal. Well, yeah, they are a big deal, but Many of them are going, again, after some very specific applications that you don't have. And as a result, they don't matter. So how do we defend against this? So the first part was really these exposed systems. And exposed systems is all about the perimeter. Now, a lot has been written about the perimeter being dead because everything is in the cloud now. People are working from home. That's true, but not quite true. We still have on-premise system. We still have a perimeter. That perimeter may now be your VPN system that you're connecting to. And that's what's being targeted. So let's walk through it. You know, what was a perimeter? What is it now? So in the good old days, uh, you had your on-premise system. You did have a firewall. And the firewall was very easy. Good guys. Are allowed to go in bad guys and kittens are always evil are not allowed in that's what the firewall does that was simple but we want features we want features we want more and more features how do we know that someone is good and bad even someone good may run a malicious application so we really have to inspect it more closely as to what's happening here so what happened is that we threw more and more features in this firewall. I'm a developer. Features, the more code I write, the more vulnerabilities, the more bugs you have. Oh, and then we also wanted some cloud remote access for all of that. 
So we don't have to come into the office. We can manage it all from home. And of course, we don't really want to use the VPN to connect to that admin interface because how do we manage the VPN if we use it to connect to the admin interface? Happened to me, I'm sure happened to many of you that you sort of took the VPN down that way, and then you sort of had no way of getting back in and recovering. So you know, we all need these little back doors where uh, you can connect directly to some admin interface uh, to to manage uh, your remote access system. So going back to the firmware not being quite dead yet, limit what's being exposed. If you do need it to expose an administrative system, try to limit at least what IP addresses can connect to it. Yes, you know, if you're connecting from home, you may not have a static IP address. But you know, maybe you have a couple different administrators. Maybe that's again where the cloud can help. You can sort of get some cloud jump off point that you connect to first, and then from that you connect uh, to your admin system. Uh, so there are a number of ways how you can harden the remote access administrative function on your system. Of course, if at all possible, don't allow sort of remote access uh, to it. But understand you know, that can be difficult uh, these days. And it certainly helps to scan for it yourself. Uh, sometimes people are scared. They say, hey, I don't want to scan my remote access because you know, uh, what if I scan too hard? What if they crash? Don't worry about it. If they would crash, they would have already been crashed by all the attackers that constantly scan them. I'd rather crash it myself than have an attacker do it for me. So pay attention to that. Passwords, if it's a critical resource, use two-factor authentication. If it's just some e-commerce site and your customers are getting upset and you would lose revenue if, if you would force uh, two-factor authentication on them. Offer it as an option, but don't enforce it. But if it's an administrator, if it's an internal user, a user with elevated privileges, two-factor. Because phishing will happen. We are sometimes a little bit jaded by sort of phishing tests. Uh, I guess you get the phishing test that looks like the last month's phishing test, and um, yeah, we found it out, we didn't click on it, we are safe. No, you're not safe. You are safe from the phishing test. Phishing tests are often nice. They try to sort of teach a particular lesson. They're not usually designed to trick you. Attackers are not nice. That's why we call them attackers. Attackers may do some research. They may pressure you to do the wrong thing. So um, assume that phishing will happen. If you say, I never click on the link, well, then remove all links from all emails and see how well that goes over with your users. And they'll complain because stuff will not work. Strip all attachments from all emails. It will not work. I taught a class a few years ago for a large company. They had a very large compromise. And yes, you know, as a result of that compromise, it cost them millions of dollars. It was one of those destructive pieces of malware that uh, erased, uh, I think, a couple thousand different computers, but they sort of had to replace hard drives and stuff. They went through it. They blocked all attachments. What happened? Everybody there gave you their home email address because that was the only way you could reach them now because all the email kept getting blocked at their corporate gateway. And you know what? Three days into the class, the organizer for the class, who's like the part of the administrative staff, uh, staff for, the, for the company, came to me and said, hey, Johannes, uh, can you help me with this? Yesterday, I got this email. It claimed to come from FedEx. And you probably know where this is going. Eh? And now his computer was compromised. Turns out that, you know, Sans ships course books for these private classes via FedEx. And he expected a FedEx notice. So sure enough, he opened it when he received it to his private email address. And of course, at his private email address, he did not have any of the protection that sort of the corporate email system afforded him. And yeah, he got hit with ransomware. 
and lost his kids' pictures. But anyway, and then defensive lesson number three, focus. Focus on what matters. It's very easy to sort of get lost in all of uh, the, the large list of, um, of exploits so that you're seeing every day. Let me just uh, swap here to one of our honeypots. I have to turn the camera here off for a moment, uh, but um, let's sort of see what we, what we see here. Uh, so uh, this is one of our large honeypots. Let's just look at uh, the end of uh, the current uh, web access log. So we see attacks against our website. We can sort of see what's happening here. So for example, one attack here. This looks like it's going against a web camera. This is a company called Access that makes a web, web cameras, sort of security cameras. This is going after it. Don't expose those. Manage your HTML. Tomcat, Tomcat, which is a big sort of Java, Java framework, uses manager HTML. That's their admin interface. So again, if you don't expose that, no problem. MySQL admin. I hope you're not using this. MySQL admin is horribly vulnerable a PHP software that's used to remote administer your database, MySQL database. Uh, we are via a web interface. It's convenient, yeah? um, but again, there's something you shouldn't expose. In particular, not uh, via, uh, not without strong authentication. This is probably the same thing they're looking for here. It's just looking for a different name. Yeah? Sometimes people think, "Hey, I'm smart. Yeah, I don't install it using the default name like MySQL." Well, you see how the attacker here is trying sort of a, a couple different ways of doing it. And then another thing, which we see this nicely here in the last log entry. Sometimes the attacks wouldn't even work even if you're vulnerable. I'm guessing here, but I think they may be trying to exploit some D-Link router. Now, D-Link, they make a lot of these home firewalls uh, that people are using. And um, the way this attack is supposed to work is that it instructs the vulnerable system to download additional malware. Now, you would see the IP address where to download it from here. That percent %s and percent %d, that means that the exploit had a bug and it did not fill in the address. So it didn't work. Yes, attackers make mistakes too. Again, something we don't really have to worry about. So out of all of these attacks here, it's about the last 10 here, yeah, nothing to worry about. Let's look at a couple that may work. Let's look for more here uh, for this mosey.m. That's a very common uh, string that you see in these attacks. So let's go back a little bit further and see if we find some here uh, that uh, would actually work. Let me go back a little bit further. Okay, now here we have a couple more. You see a Netgear, uh, that's another common one uh, that, that's being attacked. And yes, you know, here you see the IP address uh, being filled in. Uh, so we can see if we can actually download uh, what the attacker wants us to download. Uh, so let's do what the attacker tells us to do here and um, run this command. So wget, wget is a command that's basically just like a command line web browser. It just downloads files from websites. And the website here is 42.196.171. Got something here. It's covered up on my screen, which is why I didn't see it. Uh, I forgot the 227 here. So 42.227.196.171, colon, five, three, four, seven, five, slash, mosey, 
Okay. Let's see if it actually still works, and it works. And uh, by the way, uh, notice how the IP address where it instructs us to download load the malware from is the same IP address as the one where the attack is coming from. So this is a typical worm where it affects a system, and then this infected system will reach out to the internet and try to infect other systems. Um, let's see if we can make sense of um, what's happening here. Yeah, it's a binary file, so probably not much uh, to see here. This is of your typical Linux uh, binary. Um, you can see if there's anything real in it. Probably not, but sometimes we get something interesting here that um, you see. So let's see if something comes back here. This can take a couple seconds uh, to run. Okay. Yeah. yeah so uh, this actually uh, compressed. So as a result, we probably don't see uh, much interesting stuff here. And this is another thing an attacker will do uh, to evade, for example, anti-malware systems and such by compressing it. All these random strings and such uh, that uh, an antivirus system would be looking for, uh, they're now gone and you know, all you sort of have is this gibberish here. So we would have to first decompress and then we may be able to see uh, what, uh, what this particular malicious uh, code is trying to do to us. But anyway, so out of these attacks, pretty much none of them really sort of matters if if you're using an, an enterprise network. Uh, and that's a good thing. But it's also a bad thing because you may get alerts for all of these attacks. So turn them off. Alerts that don't matter, you don't want to see. Anyway, so these are some of the lessons that we sort of learned uh, from all the data we are collecting. I hope it helped you. I hope you learned something here yourself yeah, about the network. Keep that perimeter in check. Yeah? Scan it yourself. Don't wait the attacker for do, to do it. And in the end, yeah, tune your systems. I always say the ideal dashboard when you look at it, it's empty. And um, then you only see something that's, if something actionable is happening. But anyway, if you're interested in participating and submitting some data, uh, here's my email address, you know, jayulrich at sans.edu. The Internet Storm Center is at isc.sans.edu. If you are just interested in SDI and uh, our graduate program, so just you know, sans.edu without the ISC uh, will uh, give you more information uh, there. We also have uh, my Twitter handle and email address in case you have any questions. So uh, thanks and uh, thanks again for having me here.